I'm Michael Bright. I work for HPE in Grenoble in the French Alps. Uh, so I'm a cloud ops solution architect. And I'd like to talk to you this morning about unikernels. So why unikernels? Uh, maybe yourself, you've, uh, you've heard about unikernels over the last couple of years in particular. They're starting to get a bit of media attention um, and wondering what they are and what they mean for containers in particular. So myself, uh, I first heard of them two years ago. I was in full Docker mania, like, like most of us, maybe. Um, and then there started to be press reports about uh, um, seven unikernel technologies to challenge Docker in 2016. So I thought, well, wow, what, what, what's this? So I had a look, and initially uh, I didn't really grok the technology, but put it on the back burner. Then early 2016, Docker announced their purchase of Unikernel Systems, a uh, Cambridge UK company who are behind Mirage OS, which is arguably uh, probably the most advanced Unikernel technology out there. So let's have a look at those. We'll see that there are a few technologies, um, more or less purist in their approach. Um, and then I'll, I'll play with one of them, Mirage OS. So first of all, what are unikernels? Is the question we're all asking. And how do they compare to containers? So unikernels are specialized application images ready to boot. So they don't run above a general purpose operating system as we've been doing, as we've been doing with applications for years and years and decades. They are specially built with the operating system components required specifically for that application. Uh, and just to compare that with containers, because we, we, we see uh, a tendency to reduce the size of containers, reduce memory footprint, and so on, uh, but they still are running above a general purpose operating system. So even with uh, Linux Kit, which is announced yesterday, um, we're getting to a smaller, smaller OS to, to run the containers on, but it's still, at its base, a general purpose OS. So, so if we look at that, ah. <laughs> It's advanced on my screen, but not yours. So, this is weird. <laughs> uh, okay, let me... Uh, okay. Strange. Okay, so... On this uh, left-hand stack here, it's just showing a traditional application. Uh, don't get too hung up about if it's running over a hypervisor or uh, in a container. The point is that traditionally we're running over a generalized OS and there are lots of features we don't actually use for an application. Uh, so obviously, you know, our laptops, we're, we're running diverse applications, we're running it on diverse hardware, we need all this. Uh, diverse capability. But if you're running something very specific, a DNS server uh, in the internet or uh, some cloud microservice, you're using very little um, of what the OS provides to you. In particular, even multi-user, you may not be needing, you may not be, be needing multiple processes uh, to make up your, your microservice. So that's quite a, quite a stack. And let's say whether that's based on hypervisors, bare metal, or containers, you're still running above a generalized operating system. So unikernels take a completely different approach. We create one bootable image which uh, contains the unikernel runtime. So this has the operating system-like features that your application requires and any configuration that it needs. So in particular, uh, you might not need a file system for your application. You might just compile in all the data and it's, it's, it's part of memory. Uh, you might not need a networking stack, but that's unlikely. And in particular, you won't need a diverse range of device drivers. So these are very small, specialized applications of the order of megabytes of size. They are contentious. So I just put this up, this up for fun. Um, certainly, back when Unikernel systems were bought by Docker, there was a, a blog post by um, Brian Cantrell of Joint saying that Unikernels aren't fit for production. And to a certain degree, he's true. He, he puts forward some good arguments. There have been a lot of counter arguments put forward by the community. Um, and although Unikernels are pretty much a research project today, there are a lot of pilot deployments. And I think in the next year or two, we'll start to see some real progress. 
Okay, so why unikernels? So I've mentioned that uh, there are a lot of features in operating systems we don't need. With unikernel, uh, you won't have a single user. Um, sorry, you won't have a multiple user application. You'll only be a single user. Uh, you won't need multiple processes, typically. This will allow you to have better performance because you won't have context switch uh, each time you, you write to disk or this sort of thing. Uh, potentially better security as you have only the needed features, okay? No extra drivers or other uh, capabilities that your application isn't going to need. On the one hand, this means that it's based on fewer lines of code, which contributes to a smaller attack surface. But also, even if the unikernel gets compromised, you, uh, an attack will be very limited in what you can do going on from there. If there's not um, a multi-process operating system underneath, if there's not a file system or not a writable file system and so on. So there's real potential for uh, high security applications through unikernels. Uh, also, these are small immutable images. They're very light in resources. It's very quick to boot up of the order of tens or hundreds of milliseconds where that would be measured up to the time maybe to return an initial network response. It's quite a, a realistic uh, measure. How do they compare to containers? Well, as I mentioned, uh, they're potentially much more secure because we're not running over um, a generalized operating system. Uh, they, they're more efficient. Uh, and in particular, this uh, quick to boot feature means that we can envisage uh, microservices on demand a network request comes in, we identify the service uh, that needs to be launched for that, and we can launch a new unikernel specifically to satisfy that web request. Again, if that instance of unikernel is compromised, there's not much can be done, and the, the unikernel is uh, completely isolated anyway. With regards to containers, nevertheless, this remains a complementary technology. We're not going to see uh, containers replaced uh, tomorrow. Uh, they certainly have advantage in terms of usability, the ease of uh, creating applications. But we might see hybrid applications where maybe the network front end handling uh, TLS and this sort of thing uh, might be handed, handled by a unikernel. So what are the applications? Uh, so an obvious one, as I've mentioned already, is microservices, in particular on-demand microservices in the cloud. Uh, another uh, domain, one of the domains I've worked on is NFV, which is basically cloud for telcos. It differs, differs from normal IT cloud because there's um, data centers are distributed across a, a telco operator's network, and there are um, um, intense uh, network I.O. Uh, bandwidth and latency requirements. Ericsson Research did uh, an interesting proof of concept based on unikernels. Uh, which they published in January uh, 2016. And they were launching uh, virtualized network services on demand. Uh, similarly, IoT is uh, another distributed application which has uh, demands on high security and small resources. So there's possibility in the future that edge devices could themselves be unikernels. And there are some very specific networking devices or appliances that might be done in unikernels. Uh, we, we'll see the um, different unikernel technologies. One of them is HalVM. Uh, this is uh, run by a company called Galois. And they're doing some network security uh, appliances, uh, in particular one called CyberChaff. The idea is that you, you launch uh, a cloud of um, a swarm of unikernel devices, most of which are false uh, applications. So it's like a honeypot, um, and attackers will not know which one is the real instance to, to be used. Uh, ClickOS is a project that was done by NEC. Uh, as far as I'm aware, it's not very active, but they produce some very impressive NFE, again, results of uh, network performance through, through unikernels. When I say uh, impressive, they had uh, near line rate, like 10 gigabits per second, um, handling of traffic by having hundreds of unikernel instances to satisfy the demand. And potentially uh, high performance computing as well. Okay, there are a lot of implementations of unikernels. It's really wild west out there. 
Um, there are two main families. So on the left, uh, the clean slate unikernels, on the right, uh, legacy. So clean slate, what does that mean? So the, the basic principle of unikernels kernels is that we build up um, from the ground. You know, we're not taking existing OS and minifying that. We're really um, creating a, a networking stack, for example, a file system from scratch. And so the, the real clean slate unikernels tend to be built in a single type safe, statically, statically typed language. So the examples are Mirage OS, so this is the case for the uh, Docker acquired unikernel systems. Uh, Mirage OS is written entirely in OCaml, which is a, uh, a functional uh, statically typed language uh, derived from ML, which has been used for 20 or so years. It's quite widely used. Uh, to do this, then they needed uh, libraries of operating system components, and they, they've got hundreds of libraries available to them today. HalVM, which I just mentioned for the, the CyberChaff application, uh, this is based on the Haskell functional programming language, and there's also Ling based on Erlang. Okay, so these are a more purist approach, and I would say get the, the best uh, in performance and security. But uh, it will be harder work as well because you have to learn a new language. The whole, uh, the whole stack will tend to be written in that one language. On the other side of the house, the legacy uh, unikernels, which tend to be aiming for backward compatibility with an existing base. So one of them is Rumprun. This is basically um, a reworking of uh, NetBSD kernel, modularizing the existing NetBSD and building in the modules that you need for your application. Uh, there is also a, um, a small side project called LKL, which is a modularization of the Linux kernel. Uh, OSV is an interesting project. Uh, it aims to provide POSIX compatibility. So there's some applications, even like uh, the JVM, uh, Apache Tomcat, MySQL, which are available on the OSV platform and they have the capability of pulling an image, running an image. And they, they claim to get, uh, they, they produced results showing that they have better performance than using those applications natively. Uh, Include OS is one I could have put on the clean slate slide of the house because they're, it's a relatively new project. They're building up OS components from the ground up, but it's all in C. So we're no longer in type safe languages which kind of be an advantage of clean slate kernels. Um, that's a very fast moving project. And then there are many, many more. Even yesterday, uh, I came across uh, two more. Um, what I didn't mention is these are um, all open source, though there might be some non-open source ones, in particular Drawbridge from Microsoft. Uh, but there's not much news on what's happening there. Uh, there's even one for the Raspberry Pi, uh, based in Pascal, I believe. Uh, there's also some, some interesting tooling. There was uh, a tool called Unic coming from the Dell EMC camp. I'm not sure. There's a lot of talk about that last year. I've not seen too much move uh, on that front this year. And then very interesting, uh, IBM have brought a couple of projects, Solo 5 and Micro KVM. I'll talk about that in a moment. So rather than going into detail and demos of those different technologies, I decided to focus more on Mirage OS, which is what we're likely to see uh, becoming very popular in the next year or so as Docker advanced with that. So Mirage OS, as I mentioned, uh, the whole stack is written in OCaml. It builds upon application libraries already available in that language and specific OS library capabilities like its own TCP IP stack. Uh, in February this year, we had version three of Mirage OS, which came out with some significant advances. Uh, in particular, I, I like that uh, IBM contributed the Solo 5 project. Uh, this, to me, has democratized Mirage OS. Uh, previously, Mirage OS, um, you could compile applications just to run as a normal Linux binary or compile them to run on a Zen hypervisor. Solo 5 now allows you to extend that to, to other backends. So in, in particular, uh, KVM, and in particular there, micro KVM. 
Um, so to, to build binaries, I've just shown an example of just two backends here. Uh, so just to run a standard Linux binary, you'd basically do a, a Mirage configure specifically for Unix, and then that would build either for Mac OS, if that's system you're running on, or for Linux. Make depend, make, and then you run your binary. Alternatively, to run under KVM, then you specify UKVM as the back end. And at the end of the day, once you've built that, you would have your hypervisor and you would run your unikernel binary. One thing to point out here is this UKVM bin. That as well is an artifact of the build. So Microsoft, Microsoft yeah, IBM went one, one step further. Uh, by building the hypervisor itself, or at least the, the user space part, because it's based on, on KVM, to do a modular hypervisor. So the hypervisor is built to have only the components that are needed to run your application. So now we have this application with just some OS-like components and just some hypervisor components. Okay, so, haha. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm going to do this with the mic. Let's see. Uh, okay. Um, yeah. So I'm going to be a real coward and do a, a scripted demo. No risks here. Uh, so I, I've taken. I'll just show you. Uh, I've taken an example image. Uh, an example application from uh, the Mirage, Mirage repository. Um, they have a set of uh, applications under Mirage, Mirage Skeleton project, and one of them is a DNS server. Uh, so I've just taken that, I've modified it just a very little bit for, for my own demo. Oh, and in particular, this compiles in, this compiles in a, a DNS uh, database. Uh, which I modified as well. So just to show you what's in there. Okay, uh, I'm no expert on uh, DNS, so I wouldn't know to tell you about these different uh, fields, but basically um, I've defined a, a domain with my own name, so mjbright.xx. That's gonna be compiled into the DNS server, and we'll be able to query that with NSLOOKUP. You might say, well, hold on, Compiling my whole DNS database into the application, that's, that's a bit rubbish. But remember, we're really in a different mindset here, where if we want to change our DNS, then we will just recompile the application with that whole uh, database. It means as well that that thing can't be compromised. No one can hack into our database and, and modify the server. Okay. So, I just go through the steps of first building that for Unix, okay? So, uh, as I mentioned, we do a Mirage configure uh, specifying Unix. Unix as the back end, so Linux in my case, make depend and make, set that going. I won't run that just uh, because of time constraints, but I just want to show you that process and, and show you the, the artifact that comes out of that. Okay, so it's built this uh, 3.9 megabyte uh, ELF binary. So, you know, it, it's just a, a Linux application, nothing, nothing more fancy than that. Now I want to do the same thing, same build, but now building it as a unikernel specifically for this UKVM hypervisor. Okay, again, Mirage configure, and I specify UKVM as the target. So my goal here is, I showed you the building of just a standard Linux binary. So that might be one way that you would debug, maybe you would just debug as a standard Linux application. Um, now I'm building it specifically as a unikernel, so it can run at a KVM. And the fact that we have now a KVM backend means that that's something we can run in Google Cloud Engine, for example. Uh, and so I will show it running in the Google Cloud. Uh, so the first thing I want to show you is 
so we've built this specialized hypervisor, UKVM bin, uh, it's 66K uh, octets, so small. Uh, obviously, that's using the KVM capabilities within the Linux kernel. And we've built the actual application artifact, um, so our DNS server. Again, it's about four megabytes. Now, if I want to run that, um, then I'll invoke the hypervisor with the DNS server. OK. So uh, yeah, I will actually try that. Okay, so I'll do a, a DNS look above one of the things in my database. Okay, we got the IP address back, and okay, th it's actually binary data. I'm no uh, OCaml expert, so I'm just doing a fairly basic uh, printout of that. What I'd like to show, if everything's working, um, Okay, yesterday I also uploaded that same KVM application as a disk image into Google Cloud Platform. Now, what I want to make clear is there isn't a YAS out there, Amazon Web Services, Google Cloud or whatever, that is really adapted to running Unikernels today. We can do it, but uh, they're relatively slow to boot. You, uh, you need a minimum of one gigabyte of disk, this sort of thing, so, you know, uh, service providers aren't there yet, okay, but at least we, we can test the things out in the cloud today. Um, okay, so that running into instance, I'm going to do um, this view serial port to see the console of my application. I'm going to refresh that. So I didn't take any risk, I, I started this uh, yesterday evening. Again, this is just really just showing the concept that we, we can run that same application in the cloud from a simple Mirage configure UKVM. As I say, they're not very well adapted to Unix. Also. Okay. Well, while that's thinking about it, <laughs> let me just one thing. So, okay, I didn't explain very well what I did earlier, which was this NS lookup. Uh, when I did an NS lookup against 10.0.0.2 was my Unikernel running locally. Uh, this same NS lookup will use the address of that Unikernel running in the Google Cloud. Now, this wasn't working in my hotel room. I might have to connect home to... Uh, to do this. That looks like it. Okay. Ah, ah of course. Okay. okay, that would explain why I can't get to Google Cloud. I thought I am. Um, That wasn't very clever. Okay, so I completely forgot about the network. Uh, one. I'll leave that to refresh. Nice and good. Okay does help when you've got a network. Uh, just come back at the top here, just show that uh, this really is <laughs> Solo 5 Unikernel. I can't see a scroll up there. Oh, my. Oh, okay, there we go. And so we can see here uh, the actual Unikernel booting, which I booted yesterday evening. Uh, and this is uh, basically Solo 5 by us being shown here. 
Okay, let me go all the way down. Okay. I'll try that in this lookup just from my local machine first. Maybe. Oh, yeah, it worked. Okay, cool. And so now if I refresh the console here, we should see that uh, DNS request that came in. Uh, can I make that more visible? Oh, okay. It's, uh, okay, as I said, it's still, it, it's a binary record and uh, I didn't spend too much time on OCaml getting that pretty printed, but we can see the request for MJ Bright XX that came in and it sent back a reply. And back in my console, I got um, the DNS request uh, satisfied. Okay, so that was just to give you an idea. Um, as I mentioned, there's, there is no suitable YAS for these things today. But there is an interesting project by this company, uh, Defer Panic, in San Francisco. Um, but it's really, uh, they're doing their own on premises YAS uh, because they found that clouds aren't suitable. And it's just an interesting site where you can actually try out some unikernels. Um, let me just go here. So on their website, uh, you can select one of uh, several existing uh, unikernel technologies. Try those out from a, a GitHub repo and you can share things. It, it can be just an easy way to try things out initially. Okay. So just to wrap up, so what's next? I mean, are Unikernel something that uh, we're all going to be playing with soon? Uh, well, I think we'll hear a lot about Unikernels in the next one to five years. Uh, not, not next week, but they are coming. Uh, they won't replace containers, but they will complement them, uh, in particular for some very specific um, network security, IoT type applications. We'll see better tooling coming from the likes of Docker and others. Um, I mean, I think we can really expect uh, big things from, from Docker in this space. We'll see increased collaboration across projects. We've already seen how IBM, for example, has been contributing to uh, the Mirage OS work. Um, that's democratizing things, now covering KVM as hypervisor. They're also adding ARM support in there, so that will be very interesting to be able to run the UKVM hypervisor um, on ARM end devices. Uh, I know how VM are considering using uh, the unikernel base coming from uh, Mirage OS. There's a lot of healthy collaboration between these projects. Um, and then, okay, the, we will see different unikernel technologies. A lot of these are still research projects, and so there will be a lot of experimentation and the boundaries around things will also um, uh, be not so clear cut. And that's a good thing. We, we see a lot of experimentation in this space, but we'll see some real uh, deployments. So maybe uh, Hal VM may be the best place today with a, a production systems for security. Uh, Mirage OS are the one with the most momentum. And I'm sure that in future Docker cons, we will see uh, some real, um, real advances there. And then there are other, other cases like OSV, uh, good for running legacy applications with, uh, with better performance. Okay. So I'm open to, open to questions, either publicly or uh, you can catch me uh, afterwards. Yeah.